the gospel. It comes to us today from the gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter, beginning with the 18th verse. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, plans to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Again, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you ever get a chance to go to Santa Fe, there's an old Spanish mission there with a chapel called the Loreto Chapel. And there's a legend associated with chapel, this chapel. I've been there, and it's a beautiful place. But if you are to go there, you'll most likely hear the legend. It seems that when this chapel was built, they forgot to put in steps for the nuns who were in the choir to be able to get to the choir loft. So they had a beautiful chapel, and they had a beautiful choir, but they didn't have a satisfactory way for the nuns to get up to the place where they were to sing. They didn't have any good options. They could build a staircase, but that was very expensive. They could redesign the chapel and put the choir down lower, but that would have taken too much time and, again, was very expensive. They even thought we could prop a ladder up and have the nuns climb up into the choir loft. And then somebody said, that's an accident waiting to happen. There was no good answer. And so the nuns decided to do what nuns decide to do. They prayed. And one night, as the nuns were praying, a knock came at the door of the chapel. When they went to the door, there was this white-haired man who was a carpenter. He had a burro outside, and he had carpenter tools on it, and he volunteered to make them a staircase that would actually fit in the chapel design that they had, a spiral staircase, which was unheard of at the time in Santa Fe. They decided to let him try. And so he went to work, and he built this beautiful spiral staircase going up into the choir loft. If you were to go there today, they'll point out there are no nails in it. But the design of this staircase makes it hold together on its own. When this carpenter finished and went outside, they presumed to put, to put his carpenter tools back on his burrow. The nuns waited for him to come back in to thank him. And when he didn't come back in, they went outside to find him only to find that he, he and his burrow had disappeared. And no one else had seen him in town, just the nuns in the Laredo Chapel. Now the legend says that that carpenter was St. Joseph. You ever heard of a carpenter named Joseph? That this was a reincarnation, a revisitation of Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, who was a carpenter. Because the impossible had been done. A staircase had been built. It had been built in a very unconventional way. 
And if it is to be believed, built without any nails at all, holding this construction together. It is a pretty unbelievable and amazing story. And I suspect it probably is indeed a legend that suits the Laredo Chapel very well. But it also suits Joseph, the one of whom we read in the Gospel according to Matthew, the first chapter just a moment ago. We don't know very much about Joseph. We were talking about him in our Advent study just this week, talking about the characters in the Christmas story. And Joseph is just kind of there. He has no speaking parts. We only know this one little thing about him that we read in Matthew's Gospel. He's an elusive kind of figure. And in my opinion, he's the unsung hero of the Christmas story. The one that we kind of forget about. We have stories in the New Testament about Mary and the baby Jesus. Mary and the child Jesus. We have stories about Mary at the cross. But we don't have stories of Joseph. We know so little about him that we tend to overlook him and just assume he's one of the supporting roles in the Christmas story. But I want you to think just a moment about what we do know about Joseph. His story is recorded only in Matthew. It's not in Luke. But it's a pretty powerful story if you think about it. Because Mary and Joseph were engaged. They were betrothed. And what that meant was they were essentially married. They were husband and wife. They had pledged themselves to one another. But there was a year engagement period between that being pledged to one another and the actual wedding to take place. And during that year, they did not live together. They still, as my mama's generation says, courted one another. My generation, they dated one another. Or they hung out together. But they didn't live together. But the promise had been made. And so if something happened that one or the other needed to break that promise or that contract, then it was a divorce, even though the actual wedding had not taken place. That's what it was called. And so Joseph knows Mary. They're in this period of being betrothed to one another. Scripture never says, and Joseph loved Mary, but we kind of figure he must. And we figure that because of this story that I just read. Mary comes to Joseph with this story about being pregnant. And that The pregnancy happened through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't hear stories like that very often. And Joseph, this bit character in the Christmas story, by most of our understanding, was expected to just believe her and move on. And yet he knew that that was a very difficult to believe story. And that there were those in the village and in their own families that would probably have some trouble with them continuing in their engagement. You know that when Joseph laid his head down that night to go to sleep, that he was surely concerned that even if he believed Mary, 
that he was concerned about what families would say and what the townspeople would say. And so when he went to sleep that night, he had a dream. And in that dream, an angel came and spoke to him and assured him that the message that Mary had told him about their child didn't come just from Mary, but that that was truth. And that came from God. That God had indeed, as only God can, made it possible for Mary to be carrying the very child of God. And we're told that when Joseph awoke from that dream, that he was reassured that what Mary had said was actually true. Now it seems to me you really need to love somebody to be willing to hear that message and to be willing to stake the rest of your life on it. Because Joseph had a choice. He could put her away privately, which means a private divorce. He could put her away publicly, which meant stoning. Or he could have married her. And he chose to follow through with the plan that was there all along to marry her. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about Joseph as a father to Mary's baby, as a father to God's child. Who else? was there to show Jesus how to make decisions when choices came his way. And we know that choices came Jesus' way as he grew older. If there hadn't been a Joseph in the picture, if he had divorced Mary and the priest had pulled some coins out and sent her away to a home for unwed mothers, and she had her baby and worked as a housekeeper for somebody for the rest of her life, who would have taught Jesus? Who would have taught him how to make those decisions that a man has to make sometimes? If Jesus hadn't traveled with Mary and Joseph, if Joseph hadn't chosen to make the trip to Bethlehem with Mary, who would have taught Jesus how to climb the hill of Calvary? <clears throat> if Joseph hadn't been there to teach Jesus how to avoid temptation, how much harder would it have been for him when Satan put him through those temptations that he did at the beginning of his public ministry? Jesus has God as his father. But he needed a flesh and blood, walk in the earth kind of daddy to teach him those things that a boy needs to learn about being a man and about making good decisions. Joseph is not just some supporting actor in the Christmas story. In fact, he's one of the braver folks that shows up. Now, granted, Mary was extremely brave to accept the assignment to give birth to Jesus. But Joseph was also brave to endure ridicule and questions and raised eyebrows and whispers behind the hand that you knew came as he hastily married Mary 
without waiting that year's complete time. As he took her as his wife and raised the child himself. It tells us in Matthew that Joseph named him Emmanuel, God with us. And in that culture, that was a sign that this is your child when you give the name. We still do that when we baptize. We ask, what name is given this child, even though we know these babies already? But we do that because that is a public pronouncement. When those parents give the name, this is their child. Whether it was born to them, adopted by them, whether they're raising the child as their own. Joseph claimed Jesus as his boy and did the unthinkable. There is a painting by Rembrandt called The Adoration of the Shepherds. And it is my favorite portrayal of Joseph in the Nativity story. Because if you look at The Adoration of the Shepherds, you will see Mary, Jesus is in the manger. There is a shepherd kneeling in front of the manger. And then there is this crowd pressing to get in the door to get a look at the baby. And in this painting, Joseph has got his body angled just enough to put himself between the crowd that's pressing in and Mary, his wife, and Jesus, his son. The look on his face is one of protection. It's a look of, this is my family. And I'm not sure who you people are. And so I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they're all right. Is it any wonder when Jesus prays, we don't know what happened to Joseph. He kind of disappears from the story while Jesus is still young. There are all kinds of things speculated that maybe he was much older than Mary and he died. It could be that he was young and he died as well. We know so little about him. And yet we know the very most important thing. That when the angel came and told him an unbelievable story about Mary and the baby, that he made the choice to believe it. Not try to reason it out or logically explain it, but just to believe it. And then to do his part. As a husband to Mary, and as a daddy to little Jesus. And because of that, we understand much more about our Heavenly Father and our relationship with Him and how much He cares and loves us because of what we know about Joseph's time as Jesus' father and how very important that was. Joseph had a lot of choices, but he did what he did for love. Love of Mary and love of God. For we're told that he was indeed a righteous man. And I believe that when he first got a glimpse of that little baby, that everything from then on was also out of a father's love for his son. Sometimes we're asked to do things that seem pretty um, impossible. We're asked to believe things that seem pretty unbelievable. And so it's good for us to visit with Joseph 
and see how God can turn impossible situations around and make the unbelievable come to pass and work it all together for good, not just for us, but for others. And in Jesus' case, and in Joseph's case, for the good of the whole world. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. It is the Sunday of joy, and we are joyful and thankful that Joseph chose to accept the role that was given to him, and that he did it so magnificently that we remember him one Sunday out of the year, but we remember him with fondness and with love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'll invite you to turn to number 215. Now, you don't know this little hymn very well. Joel, would you play it through for us one time? But it's pretty easy to learn. Number 215, let's stand as we sing. <laughs> 